section twenty eight of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the pantomimical characters il est des gens de qui l'esprit guindet sous un front jamais déridé ne souffre n'approuve et n'estime que la pompe et le sublime pour moi j'ose poser en fait quand de certains moments l'esprit le plus parfait peut aimer sans rougir jusqu'aux marionnettes et qu'il est des thèmes et des lieux où le grave et le sérieux ne valant pas d'agréable sonnette po dan people there are who never smile their foreheads still unsmooth the while some lambent flame of mirth will play that wins the easy heart away such only choose in prose or rhyme a bristling pomp they call sublime i blush not to like harlequin would he but talk and all his kin yes there are times and there are places when flams and old wives tales are worth the graces cervantes in the person of his hero has confessed the delight he received from amusements which disturbed the gravity of some who are apt however to be more entertained by them than they choose to acknowledge don quixote thus dismisses a troop of merry strollers andad con dios buente gente y hazard vestra fiesta por desda muchacho fui aficionado a la caratula y en mi mocedad ne se ne ivan los ojos tras la arendula in a literal version the passage may run thus go good people god be with you and keep your merry-making for from childhood i was in love with the caratula and in my youth my eyes would lose themselves amidst the farandula according to pineda la caratula is an actor masked and la farandula is a kind of farce footnote Mateau, whose translation lord woodhouse lee distinguishes as the most curious turns the passage thus i wish you well good people drive on to act your play for in my very childhood i love shows and have been a great admirer of dramatic representations part two canto eleven the other translators have nearly the same words but in employing the generic term they lose the species that is the thing itself but what is less tolerable in the flatness of the style they lose that delightfulness with which cervantes conveys to us the recollected pleasures than busying the warm brain of his hero an english reader who often grows weary over his quixote appears not always sensible that one of the secret charms of cervantes like all great national authors lies concealed in his idiom and style End of footnote even the studious bale wrapping himself in his cloak and hurrying to the market-place to punchinello would laugh when the fellow had humour in him as was usually the case and i believe the pleasure some still find in pantomimes to the annoyance of their gravity is a very natural one and only wants a little more understanding in the actors and the spectators footnote the author of the descriptive letter-press to george cruikshank's illustrations of punch says he saw the late mr wyndham then one of the secretaries of state on his way from downing street to the house of commons on the night of an important debate pause like a truant boy until the whole performance was concluded to enjoy a hearty laugh at the whimsicalities of the motley hero End of footnote. the truth is that here our harlequin and all his lifeless family are condemned to perpetual silence they came to us from the genial hilarity of the italian theatre and were all the grotesque children of wit and whim and satire why is this burlesque race here privileged to cause so much to do so little and to repeat that little so often our own pantomime may indeed boast of two inventions of its own growth we have turned harlequin into a magician and this produces the surprise of sudden changes of scenery whose splendour and curious correctness have rarely been equalled while in the metamorphosis of the scene a certain sort of wit to the eye 
mechanic wit as it has been termed has originated as when a surgeon's shop is turned into a laundry with the inscription mangling done here or counsellors at the bar changed into fishwomen every one of this grotesque family were the creatures of national genius chosen by the people for themselves italy both ancient and modern exhibits a gesticulating people of comedians and the same comic genius characterized the nation through all its revolutions as well as the individual through all his fortunes the lower classes still betray their aptitude in that vivid humour where the action is suited to the word silent gestures sometimes expressing whole sentences they can tell a story and even raise the passions without opening their lips no nation in modern europe possesses so keen a relish for the burlesque insomuch as to show a class of unrivalled poems which are distinguished by the very title and perhaps there never was an italian in a foreign country however deep in trouble but would drop all remembrance of his sorrow should one of his countrymen present himself with the paraphernalia of punch at the corner of a street i was acquainted with an italian a philosopher and a man of fortune residing in this country who found so lively a pleasure in performing punchinello's little comedy that for this purpose with considerable expense and curiosity he had his wooden company in all their costumes sent over from his native place the shrill squeak of the tin whistle had the same comic effect on him as the notes of the rans des vaches have in awakening the tenderness of domestic emotions in the wandering swiss the national genius is dramatic lady wortley montague when she resided at a villa near brescia was applied to by the villagers for leave to erect a theatre in her saloon they had been accustomed to turn the stables into a playhouse every carnival she complied and as she tells us was surprised at the beauty of their scenes though painted by a country painter the performance was yet more surprising the actors being all peasants but the italians have so natural a genius for comedy they acted as well as if they had been brought up to nothing else particularly the arlequina who far surpassed any of our english though only the tailor of our village and i am assured never saw a play in any other place italy is the mother and the nurse of the whole harlequin race hence it is that no scholars in europe but the most learned italians smit by the national genius could have devoted their vigils to narrate the revolutions of pantomime to compile the annals of harlequin to unroll the genealogy of punch and to discover even the most secret anecdotes of the obscure branches of that grotesque family amidst their changeful fortunes during a period of two thousand years nor is this all princes have ranked them among the rosciuses and harlequins and scaramouches have been ennobled even harlequins themselves have written elaborate treatises on the almost insurmountable difficulties of their art i despair to convey the sympathy they have inspired me with to my reader but every tramontane genius must be informed that of what he has never seen he must rest content to be told of the ancient italian troop we have retained three or four of the characters while their origin has nearly escaped our recollection but of the burlesque comedy the extempore dialogue the humorous fable and its peculiar species of comic acting all has vanished many of the popular pastimes of the romans unquestionably survived their dominion for the people will amuse themselves though their masters may be conquered and tradition has never proved more faithful than in preserving popular sports many of the games of our children were played by roman boys the mountebanks with the dancers and tumblers on their movable stages still in our fairs are roman the disorders of the bacchanalia italy appears to imitate in her carnivals among these roman diversions certain comic characters have been transmitted to us along with some of their characteristics and their dresses the speaking pantomimes and extemporal comedies which have delighted the italians for many centuries are from this ancient source footnote rich in his companion to the latin diction has an 
excellent illustration of this passage this art was of very great antiquity and much practised by the greeks and romans both on the stage and in the tribune induced by their habit of addressing large assemblies in the open air where it would have been impossible for the majority to comprehend what was said without the assistance of some conventional signs which enabled the speaker to address himself to the eye as well as the ear of the audience these were chiefly made by certain positions of the hands and fingers the meaning of which was universally recognized and familiar to all classes and the practice itself reduced to a regular system as it remains at the present time amongst the populace of naples who will carry on a long conversation between themselves by mere gesticulation and without pronouncing a word that many of these signs are similar to those used by the ancients is proved by the same author who copies from an antique vase a scene which he explains by the action of the hands of the figures adding a common lazzaroni when shown one of these compositions will at once explain the purport of the action which a scholar with all his learning cannot divine the gesture to signify love employed by the ancients and modern neapolitans was joining the tips of the thumb and forefinger of the left hand an imputation or asseveration by holding forth the right hand a denial by raising the same hand extending the fingers in mediaeval works of art a particular attitude of the fingers is adopted to exhibit malicious hate it is done by crossing the forefinger of each hand and is generally seen in figures of herod or judas iscariot End of, footnote. of the mimi and the pantomimi of the romans the following notices enter into our present researches the mimi were an impudent race of buffoons who exulted in mimicry and like our domestic fools were admitted into convivial parties to entertain the guests from them we derive the term mimetic art their powers enabled them to perform a more extraordinary office for they appear to have been introduced into funerals to mimic the person and even the language of the deceased suetonius describes an archimimus accompanying the funeral of vespasian this arch mime performed his part admirably not only representing the person but imitating according to custom ut est mos the manners and language of the living emperor he contrived a happy stroke at the prevailing foible of vespasian when he inquired the cost of all this funeral pomp ten millions of sesterces on this he observed that if they would give him but a hundred thousand they might throw his body into the tiber the pantomimi were quite of a different class they were tragic actors usually mute they combined with the arts of gesture music and dances of the most impressive character their silent language often drew tears by the pathetic emotions which they excited their very nod speaks their hands talk and their fingers have a voice says one of their admirers seneca the father grave as was his profession confessed his taste for pantomimes had become a passion and by the decree of the senate that the roman knights should not attend the pantomimic plays in the streets it is evident that the performers were greatly honoured lucian has composed a curious treatise on pantomimes we may have some notion of their deep conception of character and their invention by an anecdote recorded by macrobius of two rival pantomimes when hylas dancing a hymn which closed with the words the great agamemnon to express that idea he took it in its literal meaning and stood erect as if measuring his size pylades his rival exclaimed you make him tall but not great the audience obliged pylades to dance the same hymn when he came to the words he collected himself in a posture of deep meditation this silent pantomimic language we ourselves have witnessed carried to singular perfection when the actor palmer after building a theatre was prohibited the use of his voice by the magistrates it was then he powerfully affected the audience by the eloquence of his action in the tragic pantomime of don juan Footnote this measure of restrictive policy which gave to the patent theatres the sole right of performing the legitimate drama properly led to the construction of plays for the minor theatres entirely carried on by action occasionally aided by inscriptions painted on scrolls and unrolled and exhibited by the actor when his power of expressing such words failed this led to the education of a series of pantomimists 
who taught action conventionally to represent words at the close of the last century there were many such and the reader who may be curious to see the nature of these dumb dramas may do so in two volumes named circusiana by j c cross the author of very many that were performed at the royal circus in st george's fields the whole action of the drama was performed to music composed expressly to aid the expression of the performers among the best of whom were bologna and Dejvia. it is a class of dramatic art which has now almost entirely passed away or is seen but in a minor degree in the pantomimic action of a grand ballet at the opera End of footnote. these pantomimi seem to have been held in great honour many were children of the graces and the virtues the tragic and the comic masks were among the ornaments of the sepulchral monuments of an arch mime and a pantomime montfaucon conjectures that they formed a select fraternity they had such an influence over the roman people that when two of them quarrelled augustus interfered to renew their friendship pylades was one of them and he observed to the emperor that nothing could be more useful to him than that the people should be perpetually occupied with the squabbles between him and bathyllus the advice was accepted and the emperor was silenced the party-coloured hero with every part of his dress has been drawn out of the great wardrobe of antiquity he was a roman mime harlequin is described with his shaven head rasis capitibus his sooty face phalagine faciem abducti his flat unshod feet planipedes and his patch coat of many colours mimi centunculo footnote louis riccoboni in his curious little treatise du théâtre italien illustrated by seventeen prints of the italian pantomimic characters has duly collected the authorities i give them in the order quoted above for the satisfaction of more grave inquirers bassius institutiorum poeticorum libri duo triginta duo caput quator the mimi blackened their faces daumedes de orationes libri tribus apuleius in apologia and further the patched dress was used by the ancient peasants of italy as appears by a passage in varro de re rusticarum libri uno capitulum octo and juvenal employs the term centunculus as a diminutive of cento for a coat made up of patches this was afterwards applied metaphorically to those well-known poems called centos composed of shreds and patches of poetry collected from all quarters galdoni considered harlequin as a poor devil and dolt whose coat is made up of rags patched together his hat shows mendicity and the hare's tail is still the dress of the peasantry of bergamo quadrio in his learned storia dogni poesia has diffused his erudition on the ancient mimi and their successors dr clark has discovered the light lath sword of harlequin which had hitherto baffled my most painful researches amidst the dark mysteries of the ancient mythology we read with equal astonishment and novelty that the prototypes of the modern pantomime are in the pagan mysteries that harlequin is mercury with his short sword called herpy or his rod the caduceus to render himself invisible and to transport himself from one end of the earth to the other that the covering on his head was his patasis or winged cap that columbine is psyche or the soul the old man in our pantomimes is charon the clown is momus the buffoon of heaven whose large gaping mouth is an imitation of the ancient masks the subject of an ancient vase engraven in the volume represents harlequin columbine and the clown as we see them on the english stage the dreams of the learned are amusing when we are not put to sleep dr clerk's travels volume four page four hundred and fifty nine the italian antiquaries never entertained any doubt of this remote origin it may however be reasonably doubted the chief appendage of the vice or buffoon of the ancient moralities was a gilt wooden sword and this also belonged to the old clown or fool not only in england but abroad the wooden sword directly connects harlequin with the ancient vice and more modern fool says the author of the letter pressed to cruikshank's punch apparently with the justest derivation 
End of footnote even pulicinella whom we familiarly call punch may receive like other personages of not greater importance all his dignity from antiquity one of his roman ancestors having appeared to an antiquary's visionary eye in a bronze statue more than one erudite dissertation authenticates the family likeness the nose long prominent and hooked the staring goggle eyes the hump at his back and at his breast in a word all the character which so strongly marks the punch race as distinctly as whole dynasties have been featured by the austrian lip and the bourbon nose footnote this statue which is imagined to have thrown so much light on the genealogy of punch was discovered in seventeen twenty seven and is engraved in ficaroni's amusing work on mascheri scenice e la figure conice d'antici romani page forty eight it is that of a mime called mac by the romans the name indicates a simpleton but the origin of the more modern name has occasioned a little difference whether it be derived from the nose or its squeak the learned quadrio would draw the name pulicinello from pulicenno which spartianus uses for il pulo galenesio i suppose this to be the turkey cock because punch's hooked nose resembles its beak but baretti in that strange book the talandron gives a derivation admirably descriptive of the peculiar squeaking nasal sound he says punchinello or punch as you well know speaks with a squeaking voice that seems to come out at his nose because the fellow who in a puppet show manages the puppet called punchinello or punch as the english folks abbreviate it speaks with a tin whistle in his mouth which makes him emit that comical kind of voice but the english word punchinello is in italian pulcinella which means a hen chicken chickens voices are squeaking and nasal and they are timid and powerless and for this reason my whimsical countrymen have given the name of pulcinella or hen chicken to that comic character to convey the idea of a man that speaks with a squeaking voice through his nose to express a timid and weak fellow who is always thrashed by the other actors and always boasts of victory after they are gone to landron page three hundred and twenty four in italian palacinello is a little flea active and biting and skipping and his mask puce colour the nose imitating in shape the flea's proboscis this grotesque etymology was added by mrs thrale i cannot decide between the hen chicken of the scholar and the skipping flea of the lady who however was herself a scholar End of footnote the genealogy of the whole family is confirmed by the general term which includes them all for our zany in italian zani comes direct from sanio a buffoon and a passage in cicero de oratore paints harlequin and his brother gesticulators after the life the perpetual trembling motion of their limbs their ludicrous and flexible gestures and all the mimicry of their faces quid enim potest tom ridiculum quam sanio esse qui ore vultu imitandis motibus vose denique sopore riditur ipso libri duo sectione quin quagente unis for what has more of the ludicrous than sanio who with his mouth his face imitating every motion with his voice and indeed with all his body provokes laughter footnote how the latin sanio became the italian zani was a whirl in the roundabout of etymology which put riccoboni very ill at his ease for he having discovered this classical origin of his favourite character was alarmed at menage giving it up with obsequious tameness to a cruscan correspondent the learned quadrio however gives his vote for the greek sanos from whence the latins borrowed their sanio riccoboni's derivation therefore now stands secure from all verbal disturbers of human quiet sana is in latin as ainsworth elaborately explains a mocking by grimaces mose a flout a frump a gibe a scoff a banter and sanio is a fool in a play the italians change the s into z for they say zmyrna and zambuco for smyrna and zambuco and thus they turn sanio into zano and then into zani and we caught the echo in our zany End of footnote these are the two ancient heroes of pantomime the other characters are the laughing children of mere 
modern humour each of these chimerical personages like so many county members come from different provinces in the gesticulating land of pantomime in little principalities the rival inhabitants present a contrast in manners and characters which opens a wider field for ridicule and satire than in a kingdom where an uniformity of government will produce an uniformity of manners an inventor appeared in ruzanti an author and actor who flourished about fifteen thirty till his time they had servilely copied the duped fathers the wild sons and the tricking valets of plautus and terence and perhaps not being writers of sufficient skill but of some invention were satisfied to sketch the plots of dramas but boldly trusted to extempore acting and dialogue rosante peopled the italian stage with a fresh enlivening crowd of pantomimic characters the insipid dotards of the ancient comedy were transformed into the venetian pantaloon and the bolognese doctor while the hare-brained fellow the arch knave and the booby were furnished from milan bergamo and calabria he gave his newly created beings new language and a new dress from plautus he appears to have taken the hint of introducing all the italian dialects into one comedy by making each character use his own and even the modern greek which it seems afforded many an unexpected play on words for the italian this new kind of pleasure like the language of babel charmed the national ear every province would have its dialect introduced on the scene which often served the purpose both of recreation and a little innocent malice their masks and dresses were furnished by the grotesque masqueraders of the carnival which doubtless often contributed many scenes and humours to the quick and fanciful genius of rusante i possess a little book of scaramouches etc by callot their masks and their costume must have been copied from these carnival scenes we see their strongly featured masks their attitudes pliant as those of a posture master the drollery of their figures while the grotesque creatures seem to leap and dance and gesticulate and move about so fantastically under his sharp graver that they form as individualized a race as our fairies and witches mortals yet like nothing mortal Footnote there is an earlier and equally whimsical series bearing the following title masquerade requilli et mise en taille douce par robert boissard valentianois fifteen ninety seven consisting of twenty-four plates of carnival maskers in the footnote the first italian actors wore masks objections have been raised against their use signorelli shows the inferiority of the moderns in deviating from the movable or rather double masks of antiquity by which the actor could vary the artificial face at pleasure the mask has had its advocates for some advantages it possesses over the naked face a mask aggravates the features and gives a more determined expression to the comic character an important effect among this fantastical group the harlequin in the italian theatre has passed through all the vicissitudes of fortune at first he was a true representative of the ancient mime but afterwards degenerated into a booby and a gourmand the perpetual butt for a sharp-witted fellow his companion called brighella the knife and the whetstone harlequin under the reforming hand of galdoni became a child of nature the delight of his country and he has commemorated the historical character of the great harlequin sacchi it may serve the reader to correct his notions of one from the absurd pretender with us who has usurped the title sacchi possessed a lively and brilliant imagination while other harlequins merely repeated themselves sacchi who always adhered to the essence of the play contrived to give an air of freshness to the piece by his new sallies and unexpected repartees his comic traits and his jests were neither taken from the language of the lower orders nor that of the comedians he levied contributions on comic authors on poets orators and philosophers and in his impromptus they often discovered the thoughts of seneca cicero or montaigne he possessed the art of appropriating the remains of these great men to himself and allying them to the simplicity of the blockhead so that the same proposition which was admired in a serious author became highly ridiculous in the mouth of this excellent actor in france harlequin was improved into a wit and even converted into a moralist he is the graceful hero of florian's charming compositions which please even in the closet 
this imaginary being invented by the italians and adopted by the french says the ingenious galdoni has the exclusive right of uniting naivete with finesse and no one ever surpassed florian in the delineation of this amphibious character he has even contrived to impart sentiment passion and morality to his pieces harlequin must be modelled as a national character the creature of manners and thus the history of such a harlequin might be that of the age and of the people whose genius he ought to represent the history of a people is often detected in their popular amusements one of these italian pantomimic characters shows this they had a capitan who probably originated in the miles gloriosus of plautus a brother at least of our ancient pistol and bobadil the ludicrous names of this military poltroon were spavento horrid fright spetsafer shiver spear and a tremendous recreant was captain spavento del val inferno when charles v entered italy a spanish captain was introduced a dreadful man he was too if we are to be frightened by names sangue e fuego and matamoro his business was to deal in spanish rodomontades to kick out the native italian capitan in compliment to the spaniards and then to take a quiet caning from harlequin in compliment to themselves when the spaniards lost their influence in italy the spanish captain was turned into scaramouche who still wore the spanish dress and was perpetually in a panic the italians could only avenge themselves on the spaniards in pantomime on the same principle the gown of pantaloon over his red waistcoat and breeches commemorates a circumstance in venetian history expressive of the popular feeling the dress is that of a venetian citizen and his speech the dialect but when the venetians lost negropont they changed their upper dress to black which before had been read as a national demonstration of their grief the characters of the italian pantomime became so numerous that every dramatic subject was easily furnished with the necessary personages of comedy that loquacious pedant the dottore was taken from the lawyers and the physicians babbling false latin in the dialect of learned bologna scapin was a livery servant who spoke the dialect of bergamo a province proverbially abounding with rank intriguing knaves who like the slaves in plautus and terence were always on the watch to further any wickedness while calabria furnished the booby giangurgello with his grotesque nose moliere it has been ascertained discovered in the italian theatre at paris his medecin malgre lui his étourdi his lavar and his scapin milan offered a pimp in the brighella florence an ape of fashion in gelsomino these and other pantomimic characters and some ludicrous ones as the tartaglia a spectacled dotard a stammerer and usually in a passion had been gradually introduced by the inventive powers of an actor of genius to call forth his own peculiar talents the pantomimes or as they have been described the continual masquerades of ruzzante with all these diversified personages talking and acting formed in truth a burlesque comedy some of the finest geniuses of italy became the votaries of harlequin and the italian pantomime may be said to form a school of its own the invention of ruzzanti was one capable of perpetual novelty many of these actors have been chronicled either for the invention of some comic character or for their true imitation of nature in performing some favourite one one already immortalized by having lost his real name in that of captain metamoros by whose inimitable humours he became the most popular man in italy invented the neapolitan pulicinello while another by deeper study added new graces to another burlesque rival Footnote i am here but the translator of a grave historian the italian writes with all the feeling of one aware of the important narrative and with the most curious accuracy in this genealogy of character silvio fiorillo che a peter si facia il capitano matamoros invento il pulcinella napoletano e colo studio e grazia molto aguenza andrea calcesi dello cuicio por soprano me gemma italia letterata pagina cento novantasi
there is a very curious engraving by bassi representing the italian comedians about sixteen thirty three as they performed the various characters on the parisian stage the cracked voice and peculiarities of this great invention are declared by fiorillo and signorelli to be imitations of the peculiarities of the peasants of Asera, an ancient city in the neighbourhood of naples for a curious dissertation on this popular character see the volume so admirably illustrated by cruikshank quoted on a previous page End of footnote. one constantini invented the character of mezzotin as the narcissus of pantomime he acted without a mask to charm by the beautiful play of his countenance and display the graces of his figure the floating drapery of his fanciful dress could be arranged by the changeable humour of the wearer crowds followed him in the streets and a king of poland ennobled him the wit and harlequin dominic sometimes dined at the table of louis fourteen tiberio fiorillo who invented the character of scaramouche has been the amusing companion of the boyhood of louis fourteen and from him moliere learnt much as appears by the verses under his portrait cet illustre comédien de son art traqua la carrière il fut le maître de moliere et la nature fut le sien the last lines of an epitaph on one of these pantomimic actors may be applied to many of them during their flourishing period toute sa vie il a fait rire il a fait pleurer à sa mort several of these admirable actors were literary men who have written on their art and shown that it was one the harlequin cecchini composed the most ancient treatise on the subject and was ennobled by the emperor matthias and nicholas barbieri for his excellent acting called the beltrame milanese simpleton in his treatise on comedy tell us that he was honoured by the conversation of louis thirteen and rewarded with fortune what was the nature of that perfection to which the italian pantomime reached and that prodigality of genius which excited such enthusiasm not only among the populace but the studious and the noble and the men of genius the italian pantomime had two peculiar features a species of buffoonery technically termed lazzi and one of a more extraordinary nature the extempore dialogue of its comedy these lazzi were certain pleasantries of gesticulation quite national yet so closely allied to our notions of buffoonery that a northern critic would not readily detect the separating shade yet riccoboni asserts that they formed a critical and not a trivial art that these arts of gesticulation had something in them peculiar to italian humour we infer from gerardi who could not explain the term but by describing it as un tour jeu italien it was so peculiar to them that he could only call it by their own name it is difficult to describe that of which the whole magic consists in being seen and what is more evanescent than the humour which consists in gestures lazzi says riccoboni is a term corrupted from the old tuscan lacci which signifies a knot or something which connects these pleasantries called lazzi are certain actions by which the performer breaks into the scene to paint to the eye his emotions of panic or jocularity but as such gestures are foreign to the business going on the nicety of the art consists in not interrupting the scene and connecting the lazzi with it thus to tie the whole together lazzi then seems a kind of mimicry and gesture corresponding with the passing scene and we may translate the term by one in our green-room dialect side-play riccoboni has ventured to describe some lazzi when harlequin and scapin represent two famished servants of a poor young mistress among the arts by which they express the state of starvation harlequin having murmured scapin exhorts him to groan a music which brings out their young mistress scapin explains harlequin's impatience and begins a proposal to her which might extricate them all from their misery while scapin is talking harlequin performs his lazzi imagining he holds a hatful of cherries he seems eating them and gaily flinging the stones at scapin or with a rueful countenance he is trying to catch a fly and with his hand in comical despair would chop off the wings before he swallows the chameleon game these with similar lazzi harmonize with the remonstrance of scapin and reanimate it and thus these lazzi although they seem to interrupt the progress of the action yet in cutting it they slide back into it and connect or tie the whole 
these lazzi are in great danger of degenerating into puerile mimicry or gross buffoonery unless fancifully conceived and vividly gesticulated but the italians seem to possess the arts of gesture before that of speech and this national characteristic is also roman such indeed was the powerful expression of their mimetic art that when the select troop under riccoboni on their first introduction into france only spoke in italian the audience who did not understand the words were made completely masters of the action by their pure and energetic imitations of nature the italian theatre has indeed recorded some miracles of this sort a celebrated scaramouche without uttering a syllable kept the audience for a considerable time in a state of suspense by a scene of successive terrors and exhibited a living picture of a panic-stricken man girardi in his theatre italienne conveys some idea of the scene scaramouche a character usually represented in a fright is waiting for his master harlequin in his apartment having put everything in order according to his confused notions he takes the guitar seats himself in an armchair and plays pasquariel comes gently behind him and taps time on his shoulders this throws scaramouche into a panic it was then that incomparable model of our most eminent actors says girardi displayed the miracles of his art that art which paints the passions in the face throws them into every gesture and through a whole scene of frights upon frights conveys the most powerful expression of ludicrous terror this man moved all hearts by the simplicity of nature more than skilful orators can with all the charms of persuasive rhetoric on this memorable scene a great prince observed that scaramuccia non parla e dice gran cosa he speaks not but he says many great things in gesticulation and humour our rich footnote john rich was the patentee of covent garden theatre and spent large sums over his favourite pantomimes he was also the fortunate producer of the beggar's opera which was facetiously said to have made rich gay and gay rich he took so little interest in what is termed the regular drama that he is reported to have exclaimed when peeping through the curtain at a full house to witness a tragedy what you are there you fools are you he died wealthy in seventeen sixty one and there is a costly tomb to his memory in hillingdon churchyard middlesex End of footnote. appears to have been a complete mime his genius was entirely confined to pantomime and he had the glory of introducing harlequin on the english stage which he played under the feigned name of lunn he could describe to the audience by his signs and gestures as intelligibly as others could express by words there is a large caricature print of the triumph which rich had obtained over the severe muses of tragedy and comedy which lasted too long not to excite jealousy and opposition from the corps dramatique garrick who once introduced a speaking harlequin has celebrated the silent but powerful language of rich when lunn appeared with matchless art and whim he gave the power of speech to every limb though masked and mute conveyed his quick intent and told in frolic gestures what he meant but now the motley coat and sword of wood require a tongue to make them understood the italian extemporal comedy is a literary curiosity which claims our attention End of section 28section twenty nine of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli extemporal comedies it is a curiosity in the history of national genius to discover a people with such a native fund of comic humour combined with such passionate gesticulation that they could deeply interest in acting a comedy carried on by dialogue intrigue and character al improvista or impromptu the actors undergoing no rehearsal and in fact composing while they were acting 
the plot called scenario consisting merely of the scenes enumerated with the characters indicated was first written out it was then suspended at the back of the stage and from the mere inspection the actors came forward to perform the dialogue entirely depending on their own genius footnote some of the ancient scenarii were printed in sixteen sixty one by flaminius scala one of their great actors these according to riccoboni consist of nothing more than the skeletons of comedies the caneva as the french technically term a plot and its scenes he says they are not so short as those we now use to fix at the back of the scenes nor so full as to furnish any aid to the dialogue they only explain what the actor did on the stage and the action which forms the subject nothing more End of footnote these pieces must have been detestable and the actors mere buffoons exclaimed the northern critics whose imaginations have a coldness in them like a frost in spring but when the art of extemporal comedy flourished among these children of fancy the universal pleasure these representations afforded to a whole vivacious people and the recorded celebrity of their great actors open a new field for the speculation of genius it may seem more extraordinary that some of its votaries have maintained that it possessed some peculiar advantages over written compositions when goldoni reformed the italian theatre by regular comedies he found an invincible opposition from the enthusiasts of their old comedy for two centuries it had been the amusement of italy and was a species of comic entertainment which it had created inventive minds were fond of sketching out these outlines of pieces and other men of genius delighted in their representation the inspiration of national genius alone could produce this phenomenon and these extemporal comedies were indeed indigenous to the soil italy a land of improvisatori kept up from the time of their old masters the romans the same fervid fancy the ancient atalani fabuli or atalane farces originated at atella a town in the neighbourhood of ancient naples and these too were extemporal interludes or as livy terms them exodia we find in that historian a little interesting narrative of the theatrical history of the romans when the dramatic performances at rome were becoming too sentimental and declamatory banishing the playfulness and the mirth of comedy the roman youth left these graver performances to the professed actors and revived perhaps in imitation of the licentious satira of the greeks the ancient custom of versifying pleasantries and throwing out jests and raillery among themselves for their own diversion footnote the passage in livy is uentus histrionibus fabularum actu licto ipsa in terce more antiquo ridicula in texta where sibus yactitari sipit book seven chapter two end of footnote these atalan farces were probably not so low in humour as they have been represented footnote as these atalani fabuli were never written they have not descended to us in any shape it has indeed been conjectured that horace in the fifth satire of his first book verse fifty one has preserved a scene of this nature between two practised buffoons in the pugnam sarmenti scurri who challenges his brother ciserus equally ludicrous and scurrilous but surely these were rather the low humour of the mimes than of the atalan farcers End of footnote. or at least the roman youth on their revival exercised a chaster taste for they are noticed by cicero in a letter to his literary friend papirius Pitus. but to turn from the serious to the jocose part of your letter the strain of pleasantry you break into immediately after having quoted the tragedy of enomaeus puts me in mind of the modern method 
of introducing at the end of these graver dramatic pieces the buffoon humour of our low mimes instead of the more delicate burlesque of the old atalan farces this very curious passage distinctly marks out the two classes which so many centuries after cicero were revived in the pantomime of italy and in its extemporal comedy footnote this passage also shows that our own custom of annexing a farce or petite pièce or pantomime to a tragic drama existed among the romans the introduction of the practice in our country seems not to be ascertained and it is conjectured not to have existed before the restoration shakespeare and his contemporaries probably were spectators of only a single drama in the footnote the critics on our side of the alps reproached the italians for the extemporal comedies and marmontel rashly declared that the nation did not possess a single comedy which could endure perusal but he drew his notions from the low farces of the italian theatre at paris and he censured what he had never read footnote storia critica del teatri de signorelli volume three two fifty eight baretti mentions a collection of four thousand dramas made by apostolo zeno of which the greater part were comedies he allows that in tragedies his nation is inferior to the english and the french but no nation he adds can be compared with us for a pleasantry and humour in comedy some of the greatest names in italian literature were writers of comedy italian book one nineteen end of footnote the comedies of bibiena del lasca del secchi and others are models of classical comedy but not the popular favourites of italy signorelli distinguishes two species of italian comedy those which he calls comedy antiche ed eruditi ancient and learned comedies and those of commedia dell'arte or a soggetto comedy suggested the first were moulded on classical models recited in their academies to a select audience and performed by amateurs but the comedie a soggetto the extemporal comedies were invented by professional actors of genius more delightful to the fancy of the italians and more congenial to their talents in spite of the graver critics who even in their amusements cannot cast off the manacles of precedence the italians resolved to be pleased for themselves with their own natural vein and preferred a freedom of original humour and invention incompatible with regular productions but which inspired admirable actors and secured full audiences men of great genius had a passion for performing in these extemporal comedies salvator rosa was famous for his character of a calabrian clown whose original he had probably often studied amidst that mountainous scenery in which his pencil delighted of their manner of acting i find an interesting anecdote in passeri's life of this great painter he shall tell his own story one summer salvator rosa joined a company of young persons who were curiously addicted to the making of comedie al improviso in the midst of a vineyard they raised a rustic stage under the direction of one musi who enjoyed some literary reputation particularly for his sermons preached in lent their second comedy was numerously attended and i went among the rest i sat on the same bench by good fortune with the cavalier bernini romanelli and guido all well-known persons salvator rosa who had already made himself a favourite with the roman people under the character of formica opened with a prologue in company with other actors footnote altieri explains formica as a crabbed fellow who acts the butt in a farce End of footnote he proposed for relieving themselves of the extreme heats and ennui that they should make a comedy and all agreed formica then spoke these exact words non boglia gia che facima comedy come cierti che tagliano li pani aduoso a cisto u a cilo 
perce colla tiempo se fa videri ciu veloce lo taglio di no rasuolo c'è la pena di no poeta e no manco boglio c'è facimo veneri nella cena porta setazione acquia vitari e crapari e ste cifenze c'è tengo spros posite da asseno one part of this humour lies in the dialect which is venetian but there was a concealed stroke of satire a snake in the grass the sense of the passage is i will not however that we should make a comedy like certain persons who cut clothes and put them on this man's back and on that man's back for at last the time comes which shows how much faster went the cut of the shears than the pen of the poet nor will we have entering on the scene couriers brandy sellers and goatherds and there stare shy and blockish which i think worthy the senseless invention of an ass passeri now proceeds at this time bernini had made a comedy in the carnival very pungent and biting and that summer he had one of castelli's performed in the suburbs where to represent the dawn of day appeared on the stage water carriers couriers and goatherds going about all which is contrary to rule which allows of no character who is not concerned in the dialogue to mix with the groups at these words of the formica i who well knew the, his meaning instantly glanced my eye at bernini to observe his movements but he with an artificial carelessness showed that this cut of the shears did not touch him and he made no apparent show of being hurt but castelli who was also near tossing his head and smiling in bitterness showed clearly that he was hit this italian story told with all the poignant relish of these vivacious natives to whom such a stinging incident was an important event also shows the personal freedoms taken on these occasions by a man of genius entirely in the spirit of the ancient roman atalana or the grecian satira riccoboni has discussed the curious subject of extemporal comedy with equal modesty and feeling and gerardi with more exultation and egotism this kind of spectacle says riccoboni is peculiar to italy one cannot deny that it has graces perfectly its own and which written comedy can never exhibit this impromptu mode of acting furnishes opportunities for a perpetual change in the performance so that the same scenario repeated still appears a new one thus one comedy may become twenty comedies an actor of this description always supposing an actor of genius is more vividly affected than one who has coldly got his part by rote but riccoboni could not deny that there were inconveniences in this singular art one difficulty not easily surmounted was the preventing of all the actors speaking together each one eager to reply before the other had finished it was a nice point to know when to yield up the scene entirely to a predominant character when agitated by violent passion nor did it require a less exercised tact to feel when to stop the vanity of an actor often spoiled a fine scene it evidently required that some of the actors at least should be blessed with genius and what is scarcely less difficult to find with a certain equality of talents for the performance of the happiest actor of the school greatly depends on the excitement he receives from his companion an actor beneath mediocrity would ruin a piece but figure memory voice and even sensibility are not sufficient for the actor al improvista he must be in the habit of cultivating the imagination pouring forth the flow of expression and prompt in those flashes which instantaneously vibrate in the plaudits of an audience and this accomplished extemporal actor feelingly laments that those destined to his profession who require the most careful education are likely to have received the most neglected one lucian in his curious treatise on tragic pantomime asserts that the great actor should also be a man of letters and such were garrick and kemble the lively gerardi throws out some curious information respecting this singular art 
any one may learn a part by rote and do something bad or indifferent on another theatre with us the affair is quite otherwise and when an italian actor dies it is with infinite difficulty we can supply his place an italian actor learns nothing by head he looks on the subject for a moment before he comes forward on the stage and entirely depends on his imagination for the rest the actor who is accustomed merely to recite what he has been taught is so completely occupied by his memory that he appears to stand as it were unconnected either with the audience or his companion he is so impatient to deliver himself of the burthen he is carrying that he trembles like a schoolboy or is as senseless as an echo and could never speak if others had not spoken before such a tutored actor among us would be like a paralytic arm to a body an unserviceable member only fatiguing the healthy action of the sound parts our performers who became illustrious by their art charmed the spectators by the beauty of their voice their spontaneous gestures the flexibility of their passions while a certain natural air never failed them in their motions and their dialogue here then is a species of the histrionic art unknown to us and running counter to that critical canon which our great poet but not powerful actor has delivered to the actors themselves to speak no more than is set down for them the present art consisted in happily performing the reverse much of the merit of these actors unquestionably must be attributed to the felicity of the national genius but there were probably some secret aids in this singular art of extemporal comedy which the pride of the artist has concealed some traits in the character and some wit in the dialogue might descend traditionally and the most experienced actor on that stage would make use of his memory more than he was willing to confess galdoni records an unlucky adventure of his harlequin lost and found which outline he had sketched for the italian company it was well received at paris but utterly failed at fontainebleau for some of the actors had thought proper to incorporate too many jokes of the cocu imaginaire which displeased the court and ruined the piece when a new piece was to be performed the chief actor summoned the troupe in the morning read the plot and explained the story to contrive scenes it was like playing the whole performance before the actors these hints of scenes were all the rehearsal when the actor entered on the scene he did not know what was to come nor had he any prompter to help him on much too depended on the talents of his companions yet sometimes the scene might be preconcerted invention humour bold conception of character and rapid strokes of genius they habitually exercised and the pantomimic arts of gesture the passionate or humorous expression of their feelings would assist an actor when his genius for a moment had deserted him such excellence was not long hereditary and in the decline of this singular art its defects became more apparent the race had degenerated the inexperienced actor became loquacious long monologues were contrived by a barren genius to hide his incapacity for spirited dialogue and a wearisome repetition of trivial jests coarse humour and vulgar buffoonery damned the commedia a soggetto and sunk it to a bartholomew fair play but the miracle which genius produced it may repeat whenever the same happy combination of circumstances and persons shall occur together i shall give one anecdote to record the possible excellence of the art louis riccoboni known in the annals of this theatre by the adopted name of lelio his favourite amoroso character was not only an accomplished actor but a literary man and with his wife flaminia afterwards the celebrated novelist displayed a rare union of talents and of minds it was suspected that they did not act al improvista from the facility and the elegance of their dialogue and a clamour was now raised in the literary circles who had long been jealous of the fascination which attracted the public to the italian theatre it was said that the rigabonis were imposing on the public credulity and that their pretended extemporal comedies were preconcerted scenes 
to terminate this civil war between the rival theatres la motte offered to sketch a plot in five acts and the italians were challenged to perform it this defiance was instantly accepted on the morning of the representation lelio detailed the story to his troop hung up the scenario in its usual place and the whole company was ready at the drawing of the curtain the plot given in by la motte was performed to admiration and all paris witnessed the triumph la motte afterwards composed this very comedy for the french theatre la mont difficile yet still the extemporal one at the italian theatre remained a more permanent favourite and the public were delighted by seeing the same piece perpetually offering novelties and changing its character at the fancy of the actors this fact conveys an idea of dramatic execution which does not enter into our experience riccoboni carried the commedia dell'arte to a new perfection by the introduction of an elegant fable and serious characters and he raised the dignity of the italian stage when he inscribed on its curtain castigat ridendo mores End of section twenty nine section thirty of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli massinger milton and the italian theatre the pantomimic characters and the extemporal comedy of italy may have had some influence even on our own dramatic poets this source has indeed escaped all notice yet i incline to think it explains a difficult point in massinger which has baffled even the keen spirit of mr gifford a passage in massinger bears a striking resemblance with one in moliere's malade imaginaire it is in the emperor of the east volume three three seventeen the quack or empiric's humorous notion is so closely that of moliere's that mr gifford agreeing with mr gilchrist finds it difficult to believe the coincidence accidental but the greater difficulty is to conceive that massinger ever fell into moliere's hands at that period in the infancy of our literature our native authors and our own language were as insulated as their country it is more than probable that massinger and moliere had drawn from the same source the italian comedy massinger's empiric as well as the acknowledged copy of moliere's medicin came from the dottori of the italian comedy the humour of these old italian pantomimes was often as traditionally preserved as proverbs massinger was a student of italian authors and some of the lucky hits of their theatre which then consisted of nothing else but these burlesque comedies might have circuitously reached the english bard and six and thirty years afterwards the same traditional jests might have been gleaned by the gallic one from the dottori who was still repeating what he knew was sure of pleasing our theatres of the elizabethan period seem to have had here the extemporal comedy after the manner of the italians we surely possess one of these scenarios in the remarkable plats which were accidentally discovered at dulwich college bearing every feature of an italian scenario stevens calls them a mysterious fragment of ancient stage direction and adds that the paper describes a species of dramatic entertainment of which no memorial is preserved in any annals of the english stage the commentators on shakespeare appear not to have known the nature of these scenarios the plat as it is called is fairly written in a large hand containing directions appointed to be stuck up near the prompter station and it has even an oblong hole in its centre to admit of being suspended on a wooden peg particular scenes are barely ordered and the names or rather nicknames of several of the players appear in the most familiar manner as they were known to their companions in the rude green room of that day such as pig white and black dick and sam little will barn jack gregory and the red-faced fellow footnote the commencement of 
the platt of the seven deadly sins believed to be a production of the famous dick tarleton will sufficiently enlighten the reader as to the character of the whole the original is preserved at dulwich and is written in two columns on a pasteboard about fifteen inches high and nine in breadth we have modernized the spelling a tent being placed on the stage for henry the sixth he in it asleep to him the lieutenant and a pursuivant our cali joe duke and one warder our pallant to them pride gluttony wrath and covetousness at one door at another door envy sloth and lechery the three put back the four and so exeunt henry awaking enter a keeper j sinclair to him a servant t belt to him lydgate and the keeper exit then enter again then envy passeth over the stage lydgate speaks End of footnote. some of these plats are on solemn subjects like the tragic pantomime and in some appear pantaloon and his man peascod with spectacles stevens observes that he met with no earlier example of the appearance of pantaloon as a specific character on our stage and that this direction concerning the spectacles cannot fail to remind the reader of a celebrated passage in as you like it the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose perhaps he adds shakespeare alludes to this personage as habited in his own time the old age of pantaloon is marked by his leanness and his spectacles and his slippers he always runs after harlequin but cannot catch him as he runs in slippers and without spectacles is liable to pass him by without seeing him can we doubt that this pantaloon had come from the italian theatre after what we have already said does not this confirm the conjecture that there existed an intercourse between the italian theatre and our own farther tarleton the comedian and others celebrated for their extemporal wit was the writer or inventor of one of these plats stowe records of one of our actors that he had a quick delicate refined extemporal wit and of another that he had a wondrous plentiful pleasant extemporal wit these actors then who were in the habit of exercising their impromptus resembled those who performed in the unwritten comedies of the italians gabriel harvey the aristarchus of the day compliments tarleton for having brought forward a new species of dramatic exhibition if this compliment paid to tarleton merely alludes to his dexterity at extemporaneous wit in the character of the clown as my friend mr deuce thinks this would be sufficient to show that he was attempting to introduce on our stage the extemporal comedy of the italians which gabriel harvey distinguishes as a new species as for these plats which i shall now venture to call scenarios they surprise by their bareness conveying no notion of the piece itself though quite sufficient for the actors they consist of mere exits and entrances of the actors and often the real names of the actors are familiarly mixed with those of the dramatis personae stevens has justly observed however on these skeletons that although the drift of these dramatic pieces cannot be collected from the mere outlines before us yet we must not charge them with absurdity even the scenes of shakespeare would have worn as unpromising an aspect had their skeletons only been discovered the printed scenarios of the italian theatre were not more intelligible exhibiting only the hints for scenes thus i think we have sufficient evidence of an intercourse subsisting between the english and italian theatres not hitherto suspected and i find an allusion to these italian pantomimes by the great town wit tom nash in his pierce penniless which shows that he was well acquainted with their nature he indeed exults over them observing that our plays are honourable and full of gallant resolution not consisting like theirs of pantaloon a zany and a w blank blank e alluding to the women actors of the italian stage but of emperors kings and princes footnote women were first introduced on the italian stage about fifteen sixty it was therefore an extraordinary novelty in nash's time End of footnote. 
my conviction is still confirmed when i find that stephen gosson wrote the comedy of captain mario it has not been printed but captain mario is one of the italian characters footnote that this kind of drama was perfectly familiar to the playgoers of the era of elizabeth is clear from a passage in mere's pallidus tamica fifteen ninety eight who speaks of tarleton's extemporal power adding a compliment to our witty wilson who for learning and extemporal wit in this faculty is without compare or compeer as to his great and eternal commendations he manifested in his challenge at the swan on bankside the swan was one of the theatres so popular in the era of elizabeth and james i situated on the bankside southwark End of footnote even at a later period the influence of these performances reached the greatest name in the english parnassus one of the great actors and authors of these pieces who published eighteen of these irregular productions was andriani whose name must have the honour of being associated with milton's for it was his comedy or opera which threw the first spark of the paradise lost into the soul of the epic poet a circumstance which will hardly be questioned by those who have examined the different schemes and allegorical personages of the first projected drama of paradise lost nor was andreini as well as many others of this race of italian dramatists inferior poets the adamo of andreini was a personage sufficiently original and poetical to serve as the model of the adam of milton the youthful english poet at its representation carried it away in his mind wit indeed is a great traveller and thus also the empiric of massinger might have reached us from the boulognese dottore the late mr hull the ingenious writer on the arabian nights observed to me that moliere it must be presumed never read fletcher's plays yet his bourgeois gentilhomme and the others noble gentlemen bear in some instances a great resemblance both may have drawn from the same italian source of comedy which i have here indicated many years after this article was written has appeared the history of english dramatic poetry by mr collier that very laborious investigator has an article on extemporal plays and plots three three ninety three the nature of these plats or plots he observes our theatrical antiquaries have not explained the truth is that they never suspected their origin in the italian scenarios my conjectures are amply confirmed by mr collier's notices of the intercourse of our players with the italian actors whetstone's heptameron in fifteen eighty two mentions the comedians of ravenna who are not tied to any written device in kidd's spanish tragedy the extemporal art is described the italian tragedians were so sharp of wit that in one hour of meditation they would perform anything in action these extemporal players were witnessed much nearer than in italy at the theatre des italiens at paris for one of the characters replies i have seen the like in paris among the french tragedians ben jonson has mentioned the italian extemporal plays in his case is altered and an italian commandiante his company were in london in fifteen seventy eight who probably let our players into many a secret End of section thirty section thirty one of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli songs of trades or songs for the people men of genius have devoted some of their hours and even governments have occasionally assisted to render the people happier by song and dance the grecians had songs appropriated to the various trades songs of this nature would shorten the manufacturer's tedious task-work and solace the artisan at his solitary occupation 
a beam of gay fancy kindling his mind a playful change of measures delighting his ear even a moralizing verse to cherish his better feelings these ingeniously adapted to each profession and some to the display of patriotic characters and national events would contribute something to public happiness such themes are worthy of a patriotic bard of the southies for their hearts and the moors for their verse fletcher of saltoun said if a man were permitted to make all the ballads he need not care who should make all the laws of a nation the character of a people is preserved in their national songs god save the king and rule britannia were long our english national airs the story of amphion building thebes with his lyre was not a fable says dr clark at thebes in the harmonious adjustment of those masses which remain belonging to the ancient walls we saw enough to convince us that this story was no fable for it was a very ancient custom to carry on immense labour by an accompaniment of music and singing the custom still exists both in egypt and greece it might therefore be said that the walls of thebes were built at the sound of the only musical instrument then in use because according to the custom of the country the lyre was necessary for the accomplishment of the work the same custom appears to exist in africa lander notices at yauri that the labourers in their plantations were attended by a drummer that they might be excited by the sound of his instrument to work well and briskly footnote in the poem on the entrenchment of new ross in ireland in twelve sixty five harl manuscript number nine thirteen is a similar account of the minstrelsy which accompanied the workers the original is in norman french the translation we use is that by the late miss landon l e l monday they began their labours gay with banners flutes and labours soon as the noon hour was come these good people hastened home with their banners proudly borne then the youth advanced in turn and the town they make it ring with their merry caroling singing loud and full of mirth away they go to shovel earth End of footnote. Athenaeus has preserved the greek names of different songs as sung by various trades but unfortunately none of the songs themselves there was a song for the corn grinders another for the workers in wool another for the weavers the reapers had their carol the herdsmen had a song which an ox-driver of sicily had composed the kneaders and the bathers and the galley rowers were not without their chant we have ourselves a song of the weavers which ritson has preserved in his ancient songs and it may be found in the popular chap-book of the life of jack of newbury and the songs of anglers of old isaac walton and charles cotton still retain their freshness among the greeks observed bishop heber the hymn which placed harmodius in the green and flowery island of the blessed was chanted by the potter to his wheel and enlivened the labours of the pyrean mariner dr johnson is the only writer i recollect who has noticed something of this nature which he observed in the highlands the strokes of the sickle were timed by the modulation of the harvest song in which all their voices were united they accompany every action which can be done in equal time with an appropriate strain which has they say not much meaning but its effects are regularity and cheerfulness there is an oar song used by the hebrideans but if these chants have not much meaning they will not produce the desired effect of touching the heart as well as giving vigour to the arm of the labourer the gondoliers of venice while away their long midnight hours on the water with the stanzos of tasso fragments of homer are sung by the greek sailors of the archipelago the severe labour of the trackers in china is accompanied with a song which encourages their exertions and renders these simultaneous mr ellis mentions that the sight of the lofty pagoda of tong chow served as a great topic of incitement in the song of the trackers toiling against the stream to their place of rest the canoe men on the gold coast in a very dangerous passage on the back of a high curling wave paddling with all their might singing or rather shouting their wild song follow it up says Malaud, 
who was a lively witness of this happy combination of song of labour and of peril which he acknowledged was a very terrific process our sailors at newcastle in heaving their anchors have their heave and ho rum below but the sicilian mariners must be more deeply affected by their beautiful hymn to the virgin a society instituted in holland for general good do not consider among their least useful projects that of having printed at a low price a collection of songs for sailors it is extremely pleasing as it is true to notice the honest exultation of an excellent ballad writer c dibden in his professional life i have learnt my songs have been considered as an object of national consequence that they have been the solace of sailors and long voyagers in storms in battle and that they have been quoted in mutinies to the restoration of order and discipline footnote the lords of the admiralty a few years ago issued a revised edition of these songs for the use of our navy they embody so completely the idea of a true british sailor that they have developed and upheld the character End of footnote the portuguese soldiery in ceylon at the siege of colombo when pressed with misery and the pangs of hunger during their marches derived not only consolation but also encouragement by rehearsing the stanzas of the lusiad we ourselves have been a great ballad nation and once abounded with songs of the people not however of this particular species but rather of narrative poems they are described by putnam a critic in the reign of elizabeth as small and popular songs sung by those cantabanqui upon benches and barrels heads where they have no other audience than boys or country fellows that pass by them in the streets or else by blind harpers or such like tavern minstrels that give a fit of mirth for a groat such were these reliques of ancient english poetry which selden collected pepys preserved and percy published ritson our great poetical antiquary in these sort of things says that few are older than the reign of james i the more ancient songs of the people perished by having been printed in single sheets and by their humble purchasers having no other library to preserve them than the walls on which they pasted them those we have consist of a succeeding race of ballads chiefly revived or written by richard johnson the author of the well-known romance of the seven champions and deloney the writer of jack of newbury's life and the gentle craft who lived in the time of james and charles footnote in durfee's whimsical collection of songs wit and mirth sixteen eighty two are several trade songs one on the blacksmiths begins of all the trades that ever i see there's none to a blacksmith compared may be with so many several tools works he which nobody can deny the london companies also chanted forth their own praises thus the mercer's company in seventeen o one sang in their lord mayor's show alluding to their arms a demi-virgin crown advance the virgin lead the van of all that are in london free the mercer is the foremost man that founded a society of all the trades that london grace we are the first in time and place End of footnote. one martin parker was a most notorious ballad scribbler in the reign of charles i and the protector these writers in their old age collected their songs into little penny books called garlands some of which have been republished by ritson and a recent editor has well described them as humble and amusing village strains founded upon the squabbles of awake tales of untrue love superstitious rumours or miraculous traditions of the hamlet they enter into the picture of our manners as much as folio chronicles these songs abounded in the good old times of elizabeth and james for hall in his satires notices them as sung to the wheel and sung unto the pail that is sung by maidens spinning or milking and indeed shakespeare had described them as old and plain chanted by the spinsters and the knitters in the sun and the free maids that weave their threads with bones twelfth night they were the favourites of the poet of nature who takes every opportunity to introduce them into the mouths of his clown his fool and his itinerant autolycus when the musical dr burney who had probably not the slightest conception of their nature and perhaps as little taste for their rude and wild simplicity ventured to call the songs of autolycus two nonsensical songs 
the musician called down on himself one of the bitterest notes from stevens that ever commentator penned against a profane scoffer footnote dr burney subsequently observed that this rogue autolycus is the true ancient minstrel in the old fabliau on which stevens remarks many will push the comparison a little further and concur with me in thinking that our modern minstrels of the opera like their predecessor autolycus are pickpockets as well as singers of nonsensical ballads stevens's shakespeare volume seven page one o seven his own edition seventeen ninety three in the footnote whatever these songs were it is evident they formed a source of recreation to the solitary task worker but as the more masculine trades had their own songs whose titles only appear to have reached us such as the carman's whistle watkins ale chopping knives they were probably appropriated to the respective trades they indicate the tune of the carman's whistle was composed by bird and the favourite tune of queen elizabeth may be found in the collection called queen elizabeth's virginal book one who has lately heard it played says that it has more air than the other execrable compositions in her majesty's book something resembling a french quadrille the feeling our present researches would excite would naturally be most strongly felt in small communities where the interest of the governors is to contribute to the individual happiness of the laborious classes the helvetic society requested lavater to compose the schweizerleiden or swiss songs which are now sung by the youth of many of the cantons and various swiss poets have successfully composed on national subjects associated with their best feelings in such paternal governments as was that of florence under the medici we find that songs and dances for the people engaged the muse of lorenzo who condescended to delight them with pleasant songs composed in popular language the example of such a character was followed by the men of genius of the age these ancient songs often adapted to the different trades opened a vein of invention in the new characters and allusions the humorous equivoques and sometimes by the licentiousness of popular fancy they were collected in fifteen fifty nine under the title of canti carnascialeschi and there is a modern edition in seventeen fifty in two volumes quarto it is said they sing to this day a popular one by lorenzo beginning ben benga maggio el gonfalon selvaggio which has all the florid brilliancy of an italian spring the most delightful songs of this nature would naturally be found among a people whose climate and whose labours alike inspire a general hilarity and the vineyards of france have produced a class of songs of excessive gaiety and freedom called chansons de vendange le grand de souci describes them in his histoire de la vie privée des français the men and women each with a basket on their arm assemble at the foot of the hill there stopping they arrange themselves in a circle the chief of this band tunes up a joyous song whose burthen is chorused then they ascend and dispersed in the vineyard they work without interrupting their tasks while new couplets often resound from some of the vine dressers sometimes intermixed with a sudden jest at a traveller in the evening their supper scarcely over their joy recommences they dance in a circle and sing some of those songs of free gaiety which the moment excuses known by the name of vineyard songs the gaiety becomes general masters guests friends servants all dance together and in this manner a day of labour terminates which one might mistake for a day of diversion it is what i have witnessed in champagne in a land of vines far different from the country where the labours of the harvest form so painful a contrast the extinction of those songs which formerly kept alive the gaiety of the domestic circle whose burthens were always chorused is lamented by the french antiquary our fathers had accustomed to amuse themselves at the dessert of a feast by a joyous song of this nature each in his turn sung all chorused this ancient gaiety was sometimes gross and noisy but he prefers it to the tame decency of our times these smiling not laughing days of lord chesterfield on ne rit plus on se rit aujourd'hui et non plaisir sans voisin de l'ennui these are the old french vaudeville formerly sung at meals by the company comte de gramont is mentioned by hamilton as being agréable et vif en propos célèbre des yeux de bon 
recueil vivant antique vaudeville these vaudeville were originally invented by a fuller of vaux de vire or the valley by the river vire and were sung by his men as they spread their cloths on the banks of the river they were songs composed on some incident or adventure of the day at first these gay playful effusions were called the songs of vaux de vire till they became known as vaudeville boileau has well described them la liberté franchise en sévère se déploie ces enfants des plaisirs vont naître dans la joie it is well known how the attempt ended of james i and his unfortunate son by the publication of their book of sports to preserve the national character from the gloom of fanatical puritanism among its unhappy effects there was however one not a little ludicrous the puritans offended by the gentlest forms of mirth and every day becoming more sullen were so shocked at the simple merriment of the people that they contrived to parody these songs into spiritual ones and shakespeare speaks of the puritan of his day singing psalms to hornpipes as puritans are the same in all times the methodists in our own repeated the foolery and set their hymns to popular tunes and jigs which one of them said were too good for the devil they have sung hymns to the air of the beds of sweet roses etc wesley once in the pulpit described himself in his old age in the well-known ode of anacreon by merely substituting his own name footnote the late rowland hill constantly sang at the surrey chapel a hymn to the tune of rule britannia altered to rule emmanuel there was published in dublin in eighteen thirty three a series of hymns written to favourite tunes they were the innocent work of one who wished to do good by a mode sufficiently startling to those who see impropriety in the conjunction of the sacred and the profane thus one pious chanson is written to grandma Cree, or the harp that once through terrors halls of moor another describing the death of a believer is set to the groves of blarney End of footnote there have been puritans among other people as well as our own the same occurrence took place both in italy and france in italy the carnival songs were turned into pious hymns the hymn jesu fami moriri is sung to the music of vagabella e gentili crucifisse a capocino to that of una donna d'amor fino one of the most indecent pieces in the canzoni a ballo and the hymn beginning ecco la messia e la madre maria was sung to the gay tune of lorenzo de medici ben venga maggio el gonfalon selvaggio athenaeus notices what we call slang or flash songs he tells us that there were poets who composed songs in the dialect of the mob and who succeeded in this kind of poetry adapted to their various characters the french call such songs chansons a la vade the style of the poissard is ludicrously applied to the gravest matters of state and convey the popular feelings in the language of the populace this sort of satirical song is happily defined il est l'esprit de ceux qui n'en ont pas athenaeus has also preserved songs sung by petitioners who went about on holidays to collect alms a friend of mine with taste and learning has discovered in his researches the crow song and the swallow song and has transfused their spirit in a happy version i preserve a few striking ideas the collectors for the crow sung my good worthy masters a pittance bestow some oatmeal or barley or wheat for the crow a loaf or a penny or e'en what you will from the poor man a grain of his salt may suffice for your crow swallows all and is not over nice and the man who can now give his grain and no more may another day give from a plentiful store come my lad to the door plutus nods to our wish and our sweet little mistress comes out with a dish she gives us her figs and she gives us a smile heaven send her a husband and a boy to be danced on his grandfather's knee and a girl like herself all the joy of her mother who may one day present her with just such another thus we carry our crow song to door after door alternately chanting we ramble along and we treat all who give or give not with a song swallow singing or chelidonizing as the greek term is was another method of collecting elimacenary gifts which took place in the month of bedromian 
or august the swallow the swallow is here with his back so black and his belly so white he brings on the pride of the year with the gay months of love and the days of delight come bring out your good humming stuff of the nice tit-bits let the swallow partake and a slice of the right bedromian cake so give and give quickly or we'll pull down the door from its hinges or we'll steal young madam away but see we're a merry boy's party and the swallow the swallow is here these songs resemble those of our ancient mummers who to this day in honour of bishop blaze the saint of woolcombers go about chanting on the eves of their holidays footnote the festival of st blaze is held on the third of february percy notes it as a custom in many parts of england to light up fires on the hills on st blaze's night hone in his everyday book volume one page two ten prints a detailed account of the woolcombers celebration at bradford yorkshire in eighteen twenty five in which bishop blaze figured with the bishop's chaplain surrounded by shepherds and shepherdesses but personated by one john smith with very becoming gravity End of footnote. a custom long existed in this country to elect a boy bishop in almost every parish footnote the custom was made the subject of an essay by gregory in illustration of the tomb of one of these functionaries at salisbury they were elected on st nicholas day from the boys of the choir and the chosen one officiated in pontificals and received large donations as the custom was exceedingly popular even royalty listened favourably to the child bishop's sermon in the footnote the montem at eton still prevails for the boy captain and there is a closer connection perhaps between the custom which produced the songs of the crow and the swallow and our northern mummeries than may be at first suspected the pagan saturnalia which the swallow song by its pleasant menaces resembles were afterwards disguised in the forms adopted by the early christians and such are the remains of the roman catholic religion in which the people were long indulged in their old taste for mockery and mummery i must add in connection with our main inquiry that our own ancient beggars had their songs in their old cant language some of which are as old as the elizabethan period and many are fancifully characteristic of their habits and their feelings End of section thirty one